the podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to the podcast that floats down here. A chapter-by-chapter read-through of Stephen King's It. Tonight, we will be discussing Part 2, June 1958, Chapter number five, Bill Denborough beats the devil, number one. I'm your host for the this week, Ben. I'm joined with me is our Stephen King expert, Melissa. That would be me. And our new reader, Luke. Hello. And tonight's chapter is 29 pages long, and it is 2.66% of the book. Luke, you have the recap. Why don't you start us off? We join Bill on his ocean-crossing Concorde flight. He is unfortunately seated next to an inconsiderate and dirty fellow passenger, but that doesn't stop Bill from reminiscing about his large and fast bike growing up. Bill dives right into the scene we left off at the end of last chapter. Ben Hanscom shows up at the site of the ruined dam Bill and Eddie had been working on to find Eddie having an asthma attack and an empty asshole. Ben Ben agrees to stay stay with Eddie while Bill takes his bike, named Silver, to the drugstore to fetch a refill. Bill takes off on the enormous bike, which takes a lot of effort to get going, and proceeds at a near suicidal rate of speed. The Banzai Bicycle Rush includes a few narrow misses of trucks and old ladies, and is accompanied by many fanatical worried thoughts from Bill. He is very worried that Eddie could die, and this opens up many thoughts about what happened to Georgie and the other murdered children around town. At the drugstore, Bill avoids stuttering by writing his refill request out. Aspirator in hand, Bill flies back to the Barons, and we, the readers, learn from the pharmacist that the aspirator is basically just water. But the air cell water does the trick when Bill returns, and Eddie can breathe again. Bill, Ben, and Eddie formally introduce themselves and become fast friends. The trio bond over a mutual hate of the bullies and discuss improvements on the dam design, with construction scheduled for the following morning. Ben feels incredibly odd and lucky to have been easily and readily included by the group. Once Bill takes off for home, Eddie informs Bill about Georgie's death, and Ben gives Eddie a great idea to avoid being taken to the emergency room for the blood on his shirt. Once home that night, Bill remembers how much losing Georgie has ripped their whole family apart. His parents do not console each other or grieve together. His mother will not let Georgie's things out of his bedroom. Both parents seem distant and cold to Bill, who must grieve alone too. Bill misses Georgie and decides to look through his younger brother's old photo album again. After flipping through old photographs Georgie made his parents get for him of family memories, Bill gets to his brother's school photo. A photo which terrifyingly speaks to Bill, warning that he will. See you soon, Bill, in my closet maybe tonight. All right, well, thanks, Luke. Uh, Melissa, what's your uh, first feeling on this chapter? Well, so I really like that it starts off just like the Ben chapter before. It starts off with old Bill, if you will. Mm -hmm. And he's flying at Derry and Derry is rushing at him. And Bill finally realizes where the ideas for his books come from. We knew all of them, but watching it dawn on him is very painful for us to see. And it's almost as painful for us to watch that dawn on him as it is for him to be having Derry rush at him. Yeah, I my I, my first note was right along with that. You know, the eighteen miles a minute as Derry rushes toward Bill. It's such a weird way to think of it, but he absolutely feels that way that he's not going there. It's rushing back to him, and he's terrified of it. It's a uh, it's a very interesting difference uh, <laughs> to to be traveling location. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, my first note with it, uh, with the chapter, is uh, it, it kind of already jumps past the flight and everything, but just the the little nuance of Bill calling a coma a comber. You know, the, he's going to slip into a coma. He's going to, and it, like you read the first time, like okay, that might have been a typo, or but it's just like six times in a row. And it's like okay, I like how King does that of making you realize, yeah, even though he's the leader, he's the you know, he's the one everybody's mentioned and looks to, you know, already uh, in the books. 
Bill's just a kid. He's just an ignorant 11, 12 year old boy who, you know, is trying to figure out what's going on with him and his family and everything and just scared shitless from part of my language. He doesn't know. And it goes back to even the older Bill of, like you said, rushing back. He is finally, yeah, remembering what's going on. Even, even enough to have him uh, step up to the, to the fat guy sitting next to him in the airplane and finally elbow him out of the way. And Bill has that mentality of he's not the one to do that. So I'm going to tie right into what you said, Benji, about him being not one to engage and not one to instigate or be part of the fight necessarily, because that's exactly how Bill seems as a kid. He describes himself as staying out of the bully's way. It's Eddie's fault for getting hit in the nose. He watches. Uh, Richie get beat up or, you know, he just watches it because he knows it's not worth getting in the way. But then he starts, even when he's thinking about like, oh, Georgie's how he used to get nosebleeds. And then he stops. And every time anything like this happens, it's like, oh, it, it's too hard to think about Georgie. It hurts to think about Georgie. And it just shows me that this is a kid in full on survival mode. He is trying to survive the trauma in his life, but he's not allowing himself to feel anything that his coping mechanism is to shut emotion down, whether it's emotion about being afraid of the bullies coming, whether it's emotion about, you know, getting mad at those guys for hurting his friends, whether it's thinking about his brother, he is not going to do any of those things. And that's been how he's coped since October. And now it's, you know, June, we're talking, what, nine months of being completely devoid of emotion to the best of his ability kind of along lines with that where you said he's kind of shut off uh i kind of feel there's scenes where he's almost has a death wish he he goes you know luke he had it uh noted really well uh uh with the bike ride uh, the bonsai trip uh but you know blasting through the intersections going full bore yeah he's trying to help his friend trying to do the right thing but he's been doing this even without that emergency like he he's opened up and said I've I've ridden this bike and I've you know done all this. And I just find it funny that he mentioned he the first time he rode he got the gash on his arm from elbow to wrist. I actually had the exact same gash on my arm from running into a fence on my bike when I was about <laughs> 11, 12 years old. So I just thought that was an interesting one. Uh, but he definitely did have a death wish kind of like or seemingly with the trauma and everything that he's been through where he just doesn't give a shit. So let's talk about Silver because he figured prominently in this chapter. Yeah, I I liked the character of Silver. Um, mm-hmm. It was it was definitely a cool take on a kid that like he even said like you know the year before he had didn't care about having a bike at all. It was just kind of a recent thing that he decided he wanted to do, and he had saved up money and bought it himself, and you know thought he'd get a good deal on it. And the other guy probably felt like he got rid of it for a, a more than it was worth. Yeah. But, you know, it is, it's a bike that's way too big for this kid. I mean, multiple people said that and were surprised that he could even get it going. And that was kind of an issue each time. It's like, it, you can like just picture him lumbering to get the giant wheels to start moving. And, but then once it well, starts going, you mm-hmm. can't stop it. Like it's just, it's just, it is a lightning bolt. Even silver, the way it's described as being silver, it's not really silver. Right. And the line says, Silver was silver, only by the most energetic reach of a willing imagination. You gotta really want it to be silver. It's and I think that's really funny. Pretty active yeah. imagination for the character that we know. Really quick, uh, going back to his uh, bonsai bike ride, really, uh, I have this one note. Uh, it's if he misjudged the holes in traffic or if he stuttered, he'd be killed. I, I think that's great advice, which just in general, but or another way to say it is uh, he who hesitates is lost. <laughs> ah. I know this quote. I know you should. I know this quote. It's Lord of the Rings, isn't no. it? No. No. Oh, what is it? Do you know, Luke? Oh, come on. What is it? Captain Wittershins. It is. You're right. It's a series of unfortunate events. I think number seven. Six or no. seven. Oh. Oh. The no. Grotto. Grotto. Gr- gr- Grim Grotto. It's like nine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was a good pull, a Ben. Deep, deep I'm, cut. I'm impressed. Thank That's you. A deep cut. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I haven't, re- I haven't reread through any of those in a long time. I just outside it, of the first one. As I was reading through this chapter and read that line of uh, he, he kind of stuttered, he'd be killed, and it was like it just in the way of thinking it. He who hesitates is lost. <laughs> it's actually a Bible quote too, but well, the other thing with his 
you know, ride through traffic is there at one point he's talking about how fast he's going and how he's trying so hard to go fast. And not that he's trying to break through like the sound barrier. He's trying to fly at the speed of memory and then crash through the pain barrier that I, I agree with you that I think he has a death wish, but it's less of a death wish and more of a forgetting wish. Like if he can go fast enough he can feel better and it was, will all go away. Now, it might all go away by ending up as a schmear on the side of the road, but it would make it go away. Yeah, it's almost like he's actively giving himself a dangerous situation so he can't think about anything that he's not doing right now. Like He has to make it so dangerous so that he can't accidentally fall into thinking about Georgie, which he does over and over and over, and it just keeps coming back. And he, like you said, keeps immediately pushing it you know suppressing it and so if he puts himself in these kinds of situations it's pretty easy to block that stuff out because you're actively distracting yourself from those other thoughts all right so uh moving forward so bill uh got to the pharmacy got the prescription um we found out something by writing it down yes well i was getting to that uh he he did uh i i thought that was an awesome uh thing on his part to have the wherewithal instead of trying to stutter it out like mm. i'm trying to stutter this out uh he just wrote it down and pushed it aside mr king was ready to get it but we did find out something else pretty interesting about the aspirator and about the you know medicine itself it's hydrox basically Med- just tap water aerosol medicine. tap water yeah, aerosol tap water and so it's like okay you know i, I kind of wonder how true that is even to today's standards of asthma medicine and that kind of thing because like Please don't take any of this as medical advice. Uh, but one thing I had always heard is somebody is having an asthma attack. You can take a, a wet or damp cloth, uh, pull it over their mouth, and let them breathe through it. And the uh, the humidity the humidity will help release or relax their chest. You know. So again, I've had it work. I've I've seen it work. Don't take me as medical advice. But so I kind of wonder how true it is that most asthma medicine is just placebo style effect. A lot of it's psychosomatic you know like your your chest tightens because you think it should be tightening because yeah. you feel like it's starting to and i mean i i get it like even like i have asthma and every time we talk about breathing i realize that i start breathing differently i started yeah. thinking about it which makes it harder to do <laughs> like gotcha. it's something you're not supposed to think about yeah you're just supposed to do it but then when you do have trouble breathing you know for extended periods of time and you start to think like right now i'm actually <laughs> thinking about it and it's a pain in the ass. Like, you're like, why is this difficult? This is not, like, a hard thing to do. And it, a lot of it, I think, could just be mentally induced, psychosomatic. Yeah. For I mean, definitely not for in every case, but there are definitely times where I, I can see where you're getting at for sure. All right. So, uh, anybody got anything else for the – before the bike ride back and getting back to Ben and Eddie? Not exactly. Mine is more of a Henry Bowers thought that Bill was thinking as he was um, racing to try and get back is that Henry Bowers is the little kid version of a natural disaster. Yeah, that, that's very Sounds apt. about right. Yep, that, that's pretty, pretty apt. I mean, it's mm-hmm. easy way to describe him because, yeah, you never know when he's going to blow in, but when he does. And he affects a lot of people. Yeah. So I just thought that was a really interesting off the cuff way to describe Henry specifically, but just. The idea of the bigger kid bully in general is as the natural disaster of little children. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, all right, what's next? So, all right, so uh, Bill made it back to uh, the Barons uh, and me- finally introduces himself to Ben and uh, gets Eddie his medicine. One thing, you know, after they talked, they became immediate friends. You know, they start making fun of Bowers and, you know, talking over whatever topics uh, that brought them together. Ben, you know, finally realizing what uh, having friends can be and almost immediately, uh, you know, and almost immediately after meeting Bill and Eddie, the mentality shifted in that scene. There was a scene where it shifted, kind of like we talked about with the Beverly uh, before, where it went from Bill over to Ben. Where it ben, did jump. Yeah, I, where I noticed that Ben well. became the primary. And when that happened, you kind of are seeing, yeah, from his aspect where the, na- know, the narrator perspective yeah. changed on us. Mm-hmm. And you basically see, you know, it's like, oh. We, we're friends or we these guys are actually pretty neat and cool and everything and yeah you know, i never thought i would want this or now i you know you can see that flip of a switch just immediately to where he never knew what he, what he was missing before but now he already knows it's right yeah and I, I think the point where it really switches on him is when he's describing you know how eddie and bill could fix the dam you know hey you guys can do this and it'll be better and bill corrects him he says we 
And we built it. Ben's like, what? And he's like, we do it. And right, mm-hmm. right then, even the next sentence, Ben goes on and he, he says, you, and it's like, oh, I mean, we, we, we do it. And this, we do this. <laughs> like he, he falters again because he just, it's so different for him, but he gets it. Yeah. Like it, like you said, it's, it, it's exactly what it should always be. And he feels very, very lucky, you know, lucky to have stumbled across people who actually give a shit about him and want to be friends with him and are impressed by the things that he can offer them as for the group. I agree, but he still really doesn't know how to people. No. Well, sure. That's not going to be a... You know, they all, he said something and he has to deduce whether or not they're laughing at him and they weren't and he figures it out pretty quick. But even the fact that he has to like stop and be like, oh, wait. Hold on. What? Okay. If you're, if you're okay. the kid, you They're not pipe. laughing. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can laugh too. Yeah. But like the fact that he's never been in a situation where they wouldn't be laughing at him oh. or even thinking about him at all because he was never the kid who really got picked on. Oh, yeah, he was. By not, not, I mean, other by, other than Henry. He well, wasn't picked on by anybody else. He was. No, but as Bill says, everybody knows who the fat kid in class is. Yeah, but it doesn't make it sound like. Any, anybody else is giving him trouble besides Henry's group. True. So obviously Henry's going to be making fun of him, but these are other people. It's not so much that he was like the picked on kid. He was the kid nobody even thought about. He was the forgotten kid. Yeah. So for anybody to give him any sort of attention, he has to stop and think it through. My note on uh, the scene was uh, Ben coming up with the idea of a coffer dam without ever actually seeing one before. That's actually kind of impressive. Luke, what are your thoughts on not being an engineer? <laughs> yeah, I mean the idea is it's a pretty pretty well known way of doing it. It's a, it's a coffer dam. Basically, you're just creating a lot of mass in one place because water is heavy, so you need something heavier to prevent it. So it's nice to see that Ben has those you know engineering principles just innately. Yeah, you know he he gets it, and that's exactly what he's just trying to get to. I have my hand up because I do. I would like to contra- I would like to disagree with you. I do not think that a coffer dam and whatever it is you said that is a pretty well known thing is pretty well known. I yeah, the only reason why I know the name you? is because they mentioned it in the book. Me you too. Know, that's the so old- some of us didn't study engineering. We have no idea. No, I, 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 so I, like I really was going to ask you, Luke. Was it a good dam? Like, did he do a decent job? Yeah, I mean, and that's what Designing I was like. It? It's it's a it's a fairly common, simple way of doing that. I mean, it's very very old ancient engineering type thing that's what i meant by well known like it's been around for Two thousands of years. years so the line that i was actually looking up i wanted to slightly disagree with what you had said melissa about ben basically uh second guessing them laughing with him or mm-hmm. so the the line and let me know if this is a different line than what you were thinking of but it it basically says Bowers ended up sitting next to me during exams. Ben said at last he wanted to copy off my paper. I wouldn't let him. You must want to die young, kid, Eddie said admiringly. Stuttering Bill burst out laughing. Ben looked at him sharply, decided he wasn't being laughed at. Exactly. It was hard to say how he knew it, but he did, and grinned. So, is that is that the same line that you were thinking yes. of? So, I don't take that as he second guessed it like or like he had to figure it out i think it was just him noticing it that you know it it wasn't like he thought oh is he laughing at me oh maybe not it seems like he quickly realized he wasn't being laughed at he he just he didn't know how but he got that that was they were laughing together on that but it was that 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 first look wait the fact that he didn't just start laughing too i took that just that glance as like a hold on i gotta process this really quick and he did it very fast and was like it's good but yeah. it wasn't a natural, oh, it's really funny. It was, hold on, wait, they're not laughing at me. He had to think that first. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't, I don't get that implication out of it necessarily. I mean, I can see where you're coming. I just, yeah. that's not how I initially read it. I, 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 I follow I, Melissa's side on this one. No, I do. I'd read it that way where originally it was like, wait a second. Okay, cool. No, we're, we're good. But it's just that Insta just have to make sure because, again, he doesn't people well. So he has to process stuff. So, yeah, like, we we talked about Eddie being maybe psychosomatic a little bit on his uh, ailment, and he, we find out that it was mostly him just being worried about his mom seeing the blood on his shirt, and that's really what causes what I'm going to call more of a panic attack yeah. than yeah. an asthma attack, and 
I just think that's interesting that it's his mom's fault or the interactions that they have, which we've seen in the past, are pretty unhealthy, you know, parenting style. Um, and it only leads to his probably actual health problems, if he has any, being heightened or focused on, which make them worse. Worst thing about a panic attack is when you start thinking, I think I'm having a panic attack. And then you, how do you get out of that re, you know, that, that uh, echo chamber of how do I get out of this? I'm stuck in it. I can't get out because I'm stuck in it. Like that's, it's a vicious circle that I think it's a lot terrible. of people that deal with anxiety kind of fall into. I, I don't personally know it, but I've, I've seen it. And yeah. I think that's fairly common. It's the, it's, I eat because I'm lonely. Yeah, I'm lonely because I'm fat. I'm fat because I eat. Oh, I've actually seen oh, I my have, child yeah. oh, have yeah. them. And mm-hmm. they are scary. And and it is. You hyperventilate. Your body shakes. Pupils dilate. And your hands are everywhere. And like it's all you can do but just sit there with them while they process through Move it somehow through the pan- yeah. panic attack there's there's no stopping it there's no fixing it there's no talking your way out of it I mean, you, you don't make it better you just like live with them through it as not somebody who has them but somebody who parents somebody who has them mm-hmm. it's really scary and if that's what eddie's having i almost and not in any way that i in any way condone what mrs Kasperk does to him but i can see how she might not know what else do mm-hmm. yeah it's it's kind of like if you if you have i don't know, say like a pond that's overflowing the only thing you can do is add more rocks to it and that's not going to help like anything you say to them is adding more rocks to this pond and mm-hmm. it's just going to keep overflowing the only way you can let it recede is to actually let it recede on its own so let's talk about who's cool and who's not basically ben and uh eddie well after they all set made plans for tomorrow to meet up and work on the dam uh Ben and Eddie were walking down the street, and uh, you know Ben tells Eddie, "Hey, you guys are, are are pretty cool, and this and that." And Eddie, you know, comes back with, "Well, Bill is. I mean, it, it's true, but at the same time, you know, it's heartbreaking because Eddie's self aware for all of his, you know, positives that he has, the mechanical stuff and his his wit and everything. He, he still sees, yeah, I'm a scrawny little sickly boy that has this mama issue." It, it, yeah, it's kind of, it's heartbreaking to see that kind of thing. Yeah, and I don't know if Bill would be surprised to learn from those two that they thought he was cool. Because we've already seen how he was with Georgie. And so he knew that Georgie thought he was the coolest. You know, like Georgie thought that Bill was like a god. Like he was just like the coolest older brother possible. So he's already... I'm not saying he has the ego thing at all. I'm saying I'm just I'm thinking he might not be very surprised to learn that other people value the type of creativity that he has or, you know, the the funny things that he does or, you know, whatever skills he brings to that because he's already seen Georgie be super, you know, admir- admiring to him. And um, it may- and maybe he still would be surprised to to learn that they think he's very cool as well. So all right, so uh, I do have one one yep. final because I think we're going to be moving yeah we're back move. to Bill's house. Yep. Um, Bill again on the stuttering sometimes thing. He doesn't stutter at all when he's writing silver, and he doesn't study doesn't stutter at all when he's making fun of Henry Bowers. Yeah, and well, not to his face, not to his face, <laughs> but when he's doing it, you know, imitating him. Yeah, and. He can. Um, he, it just doesn't come through. And I think at those times, like we mentioned, he doesn't realize he's not stuttering. Like, he, he's just so caught up in the moment of what he's doing that he's not thinking about it. Again, it's also not his voice coming out. And like, I think it's said later, either in this chapter or maybe later in the book, don't mean to be a spoiler, but uh, when he imitates or can bring on somebody else's persona, he can do it without even thinking. Like you said, the voices that he hears in his head don't stutter, so they can't be his. So he just channels those voices yeah, Ben to, notices that in this chapter. Yeah. Yeah, and also when whenever he first takes off, you know, high o silver away, it it basically says it's really similar. It's much deeper and much very similar to adult Bill's voice as well. So it's it's interesting to see, interesting to see that it's like, well, there are hints of what his voice will turn into in, you know, just in the description of that, which I thought was interesting. 
Was there anything else uh, before we get to Bill's house? So, nope, let's go to Bill's. Let's okay, go to we, Bill's. We go to Bill's, and Melissa, you have a very poignant note. Uh, I will let you start there. So, Bill starts off in the evening wanting to spend time with his parents, but he doesn't know how to do that anymore because he describes how they're like two bookends on either end of the couch. And there used to be two books with a lot of stuff going on between. So the bookends were there holding it all in. And now it's that image of trying to be the one lone book between the two cold bookends. Yeah. It's just like the overall theme of this chapter is summed up in that image. And it's just sad and lonely and depressing and nobody is working together to try and move past, not move past, because you don't move past losing a child, but like heal together. Exactly. It's yeah. very separate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, definitely. And like, uh, mine goes into it. I, I can't help but be pissed at his parents. Like, I, I, first of all, your son, yes, you lost one son. We get that. But you have a second son who's quite literally giving you signs that he's, you know, has kind of a death wish, as I said before. You know, he bought this massive bike. He saw him fall down. He's come home scraped up, cut up, you know, but you have yet to even ask him about it. And then when he wants to even interact with you, like you do the old thing of telling a joke, you just blow him off. You know, you come up with it and yeah, he stutters. So it's tough. You know, I have friends that stutter and everything, and it's tough to listen to sometimes when you're just not in the mood, but he's your son. God, you know, it's just like, I reading that part, I was just like, are you kidding me? You know, just make my blood boil just reading that because it's like, I get it, but I guess I'm also cold hearted to where, you know what, if I lose someone, I can focus on what I have instead of what I lost. And so I don't know. It just, it, that section really did piss me off reading that. But I mean, it was supposed to because you're supposed to feel bad for him and it incites the feeling. <laughs> it just leads me to believe that like therapy is here for a reason. And that is not something that was around or acceptable back then. So to me, it was like, it, they're all doing the exact same thing. Yeah. You cannot help somebody else when you are going through that. You just can't. And I could only hope that if anything were to happen to one of my kids, that I could pull myself together enough to be there for the other two. But I don't know if that I'd be able to do that. Do you know what I mean? And it doesn't sound like there's a lot of extended family around or anybody else there. To, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. If that was one of us and one of our kids and we had other kids, we'd pull in, you know, right, you circle yeah. banks, mm -hmm. no village to, you, you, you know, he's not being raised by a village. He's being raised by ghosts, Fro frozen, yeah. frozen, cold parents who, mm -hmm. like you said, can't even listen to a joke that he's got. You know, his mom just basically says, right. Uh, did you say something, dear? After he's already been shut down by his dad, like, he, you know, his dad says, oh, I know the answer fuck off basically it's like yeah like, exactly. yeah and um and it's, so it is sad. I, I used to be mad at them now i more just feel really like because i can only imagine what they're going through mm -hmm. too and we're not getting i mean obviously we're looking at it from bill's perspective but like no i mean personally i'm looking mess. at it as a because we're all parents here you know i'm looking at it and i'm the newest one but as a parent myself even if you know something horrible happened to my child and I had another one that needed me. It's like, pull your, it's kind of that pull yourself up kind of thing. And that's my mentality. And it's hard for me to see from another person. So that's why it affects me. Why I have the mentality of, you know what? It sucks, but you have other things you need to do. You still as have well. responsibilities still have that responsibility. cannot be neglected. Yeah. Like and, it's just not an option. Oh, I'm not saying that they, that it's okay that they're doing this. No. I'm just saying like, I don't want to judge how somebody reacts when that happens because as much as I would say, no, I wouldn't do that too many times in my life for what I've known about just life and parenting. I've said that. And then, you know, Oh, my yeah. kid turned four and you know, this happened and Oh, my kid turned seven and we had to put her in therapy and Oh, you know, then we had to put this kid on that. Like I've had a lot of those. Well, I wouldn't do moments and then I had to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just, like benefit of the doubt of the parents. I'm sure they used to be really good parents. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe not so much with mom not paying attention to them. But the thing I was going to say the only other example day, we had from them I know, was not a good I'm example. Just saying, like, let's just say they were parents who loved their kids and now they've lost. We one do get examples of that in this yes. chapter. Yeah. In that yes. one little part. 
for sure. And they just don't know how to love one child. It's not that they don't love him, but they don't know how to do it for With him With the absence alone. of Georgie now. And I can't fault them for that. Yeah. I can only feel sorry for them. Yeah, because that is a, a... But still be really uh, like angry that Bill isn't getting what he needs. But I just wish there was somebody else who could give it to him. Right. Because his parents cannot. Right. And uh, so at the end of that little section of the chapter, mm-hmm. it, it also describes how uh, Zach Denbro, Bill's dad, mm-hmm. tried to take Georgie's toys and things out of his room, basically to get rid of them so that yeah. it wouldn't be a shrine. He, tr- he or, tried to move on. Yeah, he's he's trying to do something where, you know, they can actually not be constantly reminded by the horrific tragedy that they're living in. You know, hey, let's try to remove some of these issues. But then his mom, Mrs. Denborough, which I don't know if we know her first name at this point, she quickly know. tells Bill's dad, you know, put those things back. Do not touch those toys. And so Mr. Denborough goes back and puts all the toys exactly back where he found each one. And then they stay there. And I'm not he pointing fingers. He also only did that two weeks after. Was it Was it just yeah, two it weeks? Was a, it, it was, was a, two weeks. Like That is pretty quick. Even I was like. Dude, that's way too soon. <laughs> but at the same, like I don't know what the the sentiment was still, be, you know, like two hey, weeks was a lot. Two weeks was quick or too close, oh, too quick, too quick. Nah, like people heal yeah. fast, people move on. You know, it's yeah, and that's I think a big part of what we're seeing is people deal with these things in different ways, and the whole family is struggling with yeah. that exact issue. Exactly. Is they're not they're mm-hmm. not healing at the same rate. They're not healing together so that you can do that. So right. many of them are shut down or isolated that there is no, yeah. you know, growth in this issue together. All right. So we are going to uh, finish up the chapter. It We move upstairs of uh, the Denbro house. Uh, Bill, I think, is getting ready for bed or he starts uh, – go, he goes into Georgie's room just to relive everything. To cope. To cope, cope. yeah. And uh, he mm-hmm. starts going through an old photo album. Uh, Melissa, what happened with that photo album? I – Oh, <laughs> didn't take notes. All right, Luke, Scary things. What happened with that photo? Bad, album? evil things. I don't know. So things. we we learn, you know, that Georgie really liked photography for photography's sake, and he he forced his parents and aunts and uncles who where are they at from what the conversation we were just having having, but he forced them all to give him photographs of you know them when they were younger, you know, basically a full family album from years and years ago. So Bill's flipping through it. He's looking for people to be comforted by i think a little bit since no one in the house is going to help him but he gets the very last photo it wasn't the last page because you know those were all blank but it's the only it's the last page that mattered is how he describes it because it's the last photo that was put in there and it's georgie's school picture which similar to what happened back in january i think he described i think he said it was mm-hmm. blinks and looks right at bill and says See you soon. See you soon, Bill. In my closet. Maybe tonight. <laughs> Pretty damn creepy. Oh. Yeah. And uh, and then he and then Bill throws the photo album across the room and and goes goes to bed. And it day. starts bleeding. Uh, it does, oh yeah, it, that's it, right. It does yeah. start to uh, to bleed and everything. One thing, uh, my, freaking ridiculous. Yeah, my, my one note for this is uh, going to the miniseries, uh, the 1990 miniseries. They did an awesome job with this shot because the kid playing Georgie, uh, the photo of it, it's just creepy as hell. He just looks up and grins and just, it's like, ha Still one of the creepier parts of the miniseries for me. I, so I noticed that Ben had that experience back in, what was it, January with the yes. silver, uh, the silver clothed it clown. The mummy. And right uh, down when he was on the bridge, he was crossing yes. the yeah yeah. I was and he made it mentally a, getting it yeah. in my head as to which one we were talking oh, about. Okay. Sorry, yes, I'm talking about that. No, you're fine. And now Bill had one, but here's what's interesting: this is not the first time this picture has moved. No, it happened the last time he went to Georgie's room a few months. Maybe not the last time with Georgie, but the last time he looked at the photo album. So it's interesting that both Ben and Bill have had these near it experiences Mm -hmm. like we know there are other kids who have been killed by it but i wonder how many other kids in 
dairy have had these near it experiences, if you will, mm-hmm. yeah. that could have been, but had the wherewithal to get away. Yeah, I don't know. Like, so I, and I think maybe this is, this will come up next chapter a little bit more from what I've read about next chapter, but I didn't take this really as an it interaction necessarily. I just, it just didn't, I didn't think of it. Like, even though it is a supernatural oh. event for sure, like what, what, what the hell's mm. going on? I just didn't take it that way because it doesn't have any of the commonalities for every other time we've seen it up to this point. So, okay. Th- like, I, I, I see that it, it clearly is. I just don't think of it the same way because he, well, there is the no one there. It's not water related. Right. That's, I mean, that's the, the big one where it's like, well, yeah. there's no water involved. And right. I don't know how, if, how there's any actual imminent danger to him. The only other thing I could relate it to would be how I initially thought of Stan Uris in the bathroom when he kills himself. That mm. even if you're isolated, Somehow it it can still make its way to you potentially, I guess. But I don't know. That that's a whole different thing, I think. Yeah. Well then, I think that will do it for our chapter notes and everything. Uh, we'll start with uh, questions for the new reader. I just have one. Do you think it can sense that it's pushing the losers together uh, when it causes the kind of havoc it, with the bullies? You know, like, he basically used the bullies to chase Ben into the Barrens. Or, in my opinion, he worked through the bullies, or the bullies were... Because Derry just automatically have this natural, visceral hatred going, which the bullies encompass. And so I'm just kind of wondering, is does he know what that he's pushing this group together? I don't feel that at all. Similar to my last point, I don't think that it was involved in the bullies chasing Ben. I feel like that was just them being cruel and vicious on their own. I I didn't, again, I didn't feel like the same thing that we saw with Weber and and those guys when they attacked Adrian. Yeah. I I didn't have that same feeling of like a switch went off and they changed. Oh, I, I do. I I just didn't. I don't. I don't. I don't catch that on this one because they were intentionally following Ben for the whole last chapter, intending to mess him up. You know, he basically just ruined Bowers. Well, summer for the most part. I don't know. I I feel like they had every intention of going after him, and he had some vicious, cruel things in his mind, regardless of any it involvement. Is how I felt about it. Oh, I agree that. Bowers didn't. Yeah, I, I would say I didn't. I didn't see the similarity that I had with oh, okay. with the Adrian part. part. I didn't see that switch that those okay. three clearly had. So I, with that, I I don't feel like it is pushing the losers club together. All right. Uh, do you the does our new reader Luke? Do you have any questions for Melissa or myself? Um. Yeah, not really, not really questions. These are more just, I see connective tissue and overall commonalities and themes that are moving forward. And a big one that we've kind of touched on, you know, like just the bill silently struggling with Georgie's death because, well, he's not really silently doing it. It's going on deaf ears. Yeah. He's, he's trying to ask for help and that just can't be good for him moving forward in that household. Yeah. Like there's just no healthy part of that for all three of them mm. in that house. Yeah. So again, no real question. It's just something I think is, it's just going to continue to be an issue, which stinks for him. And with that, I think it'll push him further into building the losers. Yes. That I completely agree with that alone. He is going to find that group, that village. He's building that village himself yeah. with, with the losers club that's being created. Exactly. Which <laughs> it, it definitely seems like that's starting to happen. And also Bill thinking that all the murders were done by the same person or thing and that Derry had somehow changed since Georgie's death. He said, you know, like, I wasn't sure if, if it really changed, but if it did, it happened at Georgie's death. Like something has changed in Derry. Yeah. And he believes that it was like all of these missing children and murder victims. He thinks that they're all done by the same entity. I, I, I think he's right. <laughs> um well, we were actually told that yeah. in uh, the first interlude chapter. 
we were told right. that the cycle started with right georgie so the fact that like we know that because we are 27 years in the future and we've been told by the town historian aka mike who mm -hmm. we know is one of our people we've been told it started with georgie but the fact that this 11 year old can deduce that or just yeah, feels that very insightful very strong connection with the things going on in town mm -hmm. yeah. so i thought it was a good chapter yeah. I, I i liked it i did too i i it's a it's a fun one. I, I not as I, I still like the one before a little bit better, but I'm a Ben fan, so. <laughs> Me too. This one was a little depressing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it not it's not be, as though. creepy. Like it there needs there, to be. there wasn't the creepy scare factor as much. The, a book moved. I don't mind moved. the not creepiness. I just like it was my pain. heart in pain for Bill. Yeah, and yeah. it's hard. To, it like and it's constant in pain for Bill. The, the it's that's the through line of this chapter. Is yeah, just absolutely his it, pain, and it's just hard to live it with him yeah i think emotionally for the book this has to be there if this was missing the book wouldn't feel real at no. all like a lot of right. the, everything's done so well that leaving this out would be oh blasphemous yeah, no, for what the book is conveying itself as yeah absolutely. so I, I i really liked the depth in his emotional growth that he's trying to work through mm -hmm. and it's tough i mean it's that's hard hard lot that he's dealing with All right, so uh, moving on to our last part, uh, what's your favorite things of this chapter? Uh, Luke, what was yours? My favorite thing was Bill's entire bonsai ride to the drugstore. <laughs> I just loved the, you know, it, he mentions that he knew all of the stop signs were in, you know, his favor. But if someone would blow through one of those stop signs at some point, he was toast. And like, he keeps talking about how, like, eh, I could easily be killed, like, at any point here. But again, let's not think about that. Let's just keep moving and just... I like Melissa's description of, you know, using silver as a drug to get by in this in this time. And that's that's a pretty interesting uh, take on it. But I love that that whole writing from Ben and Eddie to the drugstore. So so my another connection would be happy Hunger Games. May the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yes. It's very somebody's got to die. Yep. It might be me. Yep. I'm going to try it. Yeah. <laughs> like. It, yeah, yeah, it's bad. No, exactly. Uh, my favorite thing of this chapter was uh, Ben's uh, coming up with the dam and impressing Bill and uh, Eddie just on the spot of his intelligence and, and his bravery, too, for standing up to Bowers and all that. Uh, and so just the immediately realizing coming friends and, but you know, like I said, that, that dam spot was like, okay, that's, you know, again, pretty damn impressive. It was damn it was impressive. Uh, pun yeah. alright Melissa what was your favorite thing my favorite thing was we not you mm -hmm. yeah that was that they they made an effort and a point in a way to say no we're gonna build the dam you're part of this you are included yeah with mm -hmm. if you don't like it, it it's you understood it's yeah, a we it's like, right. you need to get bored oh wait no we need to get bored the, the royal we it's yeah. a thing now yeah. yeah Ben's a member Yep. That's how he joins, yep. and and that was his introduction, and yep. and what no not introduction initiation yeah. into In, the loser's induction. Club. There's the word. Yep. Thank uh, you. So I liked that. All right. So on that note, we thank you for joining us this week. Uh, if you can follow us on social media on Twitter at floats down here. Uh, it floats down here at gmail.com. You can send us any email with questions, concerns, or any shout outs or anything you'd like. Uh, you can look us up at the podcast that.com. Make sure you subscribe and rate us on iTunes. Uh, your reviews go a long way to uh, helping us get this out there a bit more. So next week, we'll be talking about chapter six. One of the missing, a tale from the summer of 58. Stay imaginary. You'll float too. Thanks. 